So welcome to the first lab for 2401. Today we're going to be talking mostly about the language of anatomy. And so before we get started, though, I want you to make sure that you have your checklist with you. So if you go to eCampus and you click on courses, and then if you come down here and click on checklists for labs, it's going to show you this. Now, you're only going to be able to see the first one because the other two are blacked out. We haven't gotten to that yet. But if you click for exam one, what you're going to see are these um, checklists. And so remember what a checklist is. If you watch my video, a checklist is just basically a list. It's a list of things you're responsible for. And so you can go down the list and as you learn it or as you find it or whatever, you can check it off. That's why it's called a checklist. But there are so many things in this book and in the textbook and so on that there's just no way to really learn it all in one course. And so what I've done is I've tried to go through and pick out the things that I think are important. And then you'll find it on this checklist. And so if you look at this first one, this is what we're going to cover today. Uh, it's going to look something like this. And so look, here's a bunch of anatomical terms. That's what we're going to be looking at very first. And so these are those anatomical terms. Now, these are in alphabetical order. Yours may not or may not cover them in alphabetical order. But again, these are the things you're responsible for. And so if it's not on a checklist, you're not responsible for it for lab. So checklists are just for lab but you're not responsible unless it's on this checklist. Does everybody understand what a checklist is for and how to go about using one? Okay. So <clears throat> what we're going to be looking at is the language of anatomy. Um, when we look at anatomy, remember this morning, or if you were here this morning, we talked about how anatomy was all about structures. It's all about parts. And remember, there's a whole lot of names. And so we're going to see a bunch of names that don't really correspond to the kind of names that you had when you were a child or even to this day. But we're going to start looking at them. And that's basically called the language of anatomy. It's called that because anatomy really does seem to have its own language. Because when you read it, it's not usually English. It's not English. It's going to be Greek or it's going to be Latin. Sometimes it's Italian or German. And a few times it's English. But it's mostly these things, Greek and Latin. And so when we learn the names of body parts, we don't use Greek and Latin. And so we have the common names for things, and then we have the anatomical names. So look at this, and you can find this picture in your lab book. Here's the figure number if you ever want to look. But look, here's some, some of these um, names. So think about this right here. When you were a kid, and even to this day, you probably called it your chin. And if you look here, you can see chin is in parentheses. That's the common name for it. But in here, it's not chin. It's mental. Well, most people, when they hear the word mental, they don't think of the chin. They think of something to do with your thoughts or your brain or something like that. Well, the reason this is called mental is because if you look at it, there are two little holes, one right here and one right on the other side, right here and right here. And if you've ever noticed what someone try or does when they're trying to think of something really, really hard, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll grab their chin with their hand and maybe even stroke their chin. And so the Greeks thought that when you did that, it made a little light bulb go off in the top of your head. And so they called the chin the mental. So when you look at it, it's not chin anymore. It's mental. Your cheek is not cheek. It's buckle. Your eye is not eye. It's orbital. And so there's this whole list of these. And so these are just a few on just the head. We can add in more. So if we come down here, we're going to see a whole lot more. 
So we're going to see this, which is called a chromial, which is the point of your shoulder right here. And then the arm is not the arm anymore. It's brachial. And your forearm is antibrachial. And, and your thumb is not the thumb. It's pollux. Well, I can't go through all of these and have you learn them as we go through them. So you're really going to have to spend some time going down and learning these yourself. And we haven't stopped here. We also have down here. And so again, knee, not knee, it's patellar and so on. And this is just on the front side of the body. So if we turn the body around and look at it and we look at the back side, we're going to have the same thing. We're going to have the same issue here. And so here it is on the head. There's the um, chest and buttocks and so on. And there's the legs on the back side. So again, there's no way for us to do all of these uh, at once, but we can do a few of them. So real quickly, look over these and go down kind of the list. And what you might see is something like this is a quiz, but it would look like this. So the question would be, what is that? Name that. Or if you remember this, what is the question here? Name that. That's your chin. Do you may remember what it's called? Yeah, so this is the mental. This is your belly button, and that's called the umbilical. Now, you're not going to be writing things. It's going to be matching, but still, that's exactly what it would be. Same thing if we did the backside. So if we come down here, look, there's sacral. That's the area between the hips right here. Uh, chromial, we saw that from the other side. That's the point of the shoulder, axillary, and so on and so on. And so, again, same thing. There's just a few of them. And you might see a quiz that looks something like that. Does it make sense to everyone? Another thing is, when we look at the, the skeleton, which we're going to look at, not today, but later on, you can see that the skeleton is divided into two sections, too. And so this yellow is called the axial skeleton. So that's the axial part of the body. So if we were to back up, this part of the body right here is the axial part of the body. And then if we look at this picture here, everything that's green is called the appendicular skeleton or appendicular part of the body. And so if we look here, here's the appendicular part of the body. All of this, that's the appendicular. So not only do we have these individual names, we also have these divisions. And so there's two of these divisions. Again, axial and appendicular. Well, the only reason we have all these names and the only reason we have standardized names is so we are all using the same thing. So we can talk to each other. We can communicate. And we can communicate in, in uh, spoken word, but we can also communicate in written word and so on. And there's no confusion if everybody uses the same terminology. Another thing is has to do with this communication is we want to be able to talk to each other. So look, what if we were in a lab and I was over here and I hear my cadaver laying here like this. So there's my cadaver and he's laying on his back like this. And so here I am and I'm looking at this part of the cadaver and somebody else is way over here. They have a different cadaver, but their cadaver is laying like this. It's laying face down. So if I'm looking at this and someone else is looking at this and we're trying to communicate with each other, it's going to be very, very difficult. Even if I know that this one is upside down compared to that one, it's still, still very difficult to communicate because what I see is not what someone else sees. And so what we do to try to combat this is we pretend, we pretend 
And what we do is we pretend everyone is in something called anatomical position. So when you go to anatomical position, it looks like this. So even though our cadaver was laying down here like this, when we look at it and when we talk to this person over here, we pretend this is in this position. So anatomical position is standing upright, palms facing forward, little fingers next to the thigh. Everything is looking straight ahead. So no matter what position they're in, when we think about them or talk about them, we mentally put our patient, we mentally put our model, we mentally put whatever it is that we're talking about in this position. But look at this position. It's kind of odd. Look at this person. Look at her. There's something very odd about the way she's standing. Can anybody figure out what's really odd about this? So Victoria says, I'm only seeing the first slide. Victoria, you may have to uh, exit and come back in if you're having a problem. Yeah, here's the problem right here. Nobody stands this way. Nobody. In fact, if you stand this way very long, it's going to begin to hurt. It's an uncomfortable position. So there has to be a good reason for this to be anatomical position because this is what we're going to choose for everybody to be in mentally. There has to be a good reason for it, and there is. If you look in the lower arm, there are two bones. The bones are called the radius and the ulna. That's not important right now. But look, when you're in anatomical position, the bones are parallel to each other. But most people don't stand that way. Their hands rotate in like this so that their thumbs are next to their thighs. Well, when that happens, look what happens to the bones. They cross each other. And it's not just bones. It's also things like nerves. It's also things like blood vessels. It's also things like muscles. Everything is crossed now. And so it makes it a whole lot harder to describe because everything is crossed. And so anatomical position is this way. It's this way because everything here is straight and parallel to each other. Does that make sense to everyone? So you might stand up and put yourself in anatomical position. And very quickly, you're going to find out how weird it is and how uncomfortable it is. And again, there must be a good reason. And this is that reason. Any questions about anatomical names or anatomical position? So he says she had a question about the quizzes. What is your question? Zoe, typically there's always going to be one lab quiz. Lecture quizzes are sporadic, so not always. Today, I don't think we're going to have a quiz because, well, we might. Um, but there's always going to be a lab quiz. So there'll always be one. Sometimes there'll be more than one. But remember, you don't have to do them on the same day. They're just going to open today. They're not actually due until the very end of class. Now, that doesn't mean you should wait, but, um, but that's the opening day. All right, well, let's go on. 
So we still want to be able to talk to each other. We want to be able, and you could be, I don't know, in Paris, and I could be in, I don't know, Dallas. And we want to be able to talk to each other. We want to use the same terms. We want to use the same everything. And that includes something called directional terms because we want to be able to talk to how things are related to each other. Well, directional terms are something we use all the time. Look at this. These are directional terms. So look, north, south, east, west, up, down, so on. Notice they're usually in pairs, and the pairs usually have opposite meaning. So we use these all the time. If I were to ask you how to get to the North Lake College campus, well, you'd give me directions. You'd use these directional terms. You'd say, go north on three or whatever. You would use these directional terms. But look at these. They don't make sense on a piece on a person. I mean, where is east on a person? It just doesn't make any sense at all. So we have our own set of directional terms. Again, though, they're going to come in pairs, and they mostly are going to have opposite meanings. And so let's look at some of these. And so when we look at them, they're superior and inferior, anterior and posterior, proximal and distal. These are all directional terms we're going to use. Well, we're going to look at all of them individually. Let's look at superior and inferior first. So superior means above and inferior means below. So if you think about this, if, if here's your heart and here's your brain, the brain is superior to the heart. But here's your heart and here's your bladder. The bladder is inferior to the heart. Does it make sense to everyone? Superior, inferior. So if I were to ask you, what is your most superior part, what would it be? What is the most superior thing on your body? Yeah, a head. So our superior is this way. And if I asked you what's the most inferior part, you'd probably say the feet. So superior means above, inferior means below. Let's look at another. If you look at humans and all, and all mammals, we have a front. We have a front, and our front does not look like our back. So they're very obviously different. The front is where your face is, it's where the breasts are, it's where the genitals are, and so on. The front. And then the back, obviously you know what's back there. But instead of using front and back, we use anterior and posterior. Anterior, anti, means before. So this is our before side right here, our before side. And posterior, post, means after. So this is our after side right here. So anterior and posterior. Well, we also use ventral and dorsal. Ventral basically means the same thing as anterior, and dorsal means the same thing as posterior, but not exactly. If you look at a person, if you look about what's on their front, their, the biggest part of their front, is this part right here, which is called the belly. And ventral means the belly side is what it means, the belly side. Well, in humans, our front is our belly side. And so those two are used interchangeably. If you look at the others, Dorsal refers to the spine, so it's the spinal side. 
So here's our spine back here. And so the spinal side is this after side, the back side. And so posterior and dorsal are used interchangeably. But that's not always true. That's not always true. I have a picture. Think about a dog. I'm going to have to draw a dog. I thought I had a picture. But look, what if you have a dog? So here's a dog. It's going to be like a dachshund dog or something. He's got this long back and then a tail. So here is the before part of the dog. What would you call that? What is this direction? Anybody know? What's the word for front? Anterior, that's right. Just like this is anterior for a human. But what does ventral mean, do you remember? Ventral means belly side. Well, that's here for a human, but it's here for the dog. This way is ventral. Does that make sense? Erica says, I cannot see what you're writing. Erica, all I can tell you is to, to exit and come back in and see if it's, it's better. And then look at this other one. So here's our dog again. Which, way, which direction is this on the dog? Posterior, that's exactly right. This is the after part of the dog. And for humans, remember, this is posterior. But dorsal doesn't mean that, remember? Dorsal means spinal side. Well, on a dog, here's the spine. So this is dorsal on a dog. This is dorsal. Now, I'm not trying to confuse you, and I'm not going to ask you questions about a four-legged animal. But what I want you to realize is even though we use these interchangeably, they don't mean the same things. We use them interchangeably, but they don't mean the same things. And so I'd like you to, to remember what they mean, not just that they're interchangeable, but what they actually mean. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. We also, as humans, have a midline. Look, if I take a person, I can draw a line right down the very center. That's called the midline. And because we're what's called bilaterally symmetrical, in other words, we are symmetrical on either side, what you have on one side, you pretty much have on the other. So look, I have an eye over here and I have an eye over here. I have an ear over here and I have an ear over here. I have a hand over here and I have a hand over here. So one side is pretty much the mirror image of the other side. Even if you think about the nose and the mouth, half of it's on one side, half of it's on the other. Nipple here, nipple here. We're bilaterally symmetrical. So since we're bilaterally symmetrical, we have this midline. So I can use this midline as a directional point. I can move toward the midline or I can move away from the midline. If you move toward it, it's called medial, toward the midline. If I move away from it, it's called lateral, away from the midline. So what if I took the face right here, here's an eye and here's an eye, there's my nose, and there's my mouth, and here's an ear, and there's an ear over here. And look, 
Here's my midline right here. So what if I said to you, the eyes are blank to the ears. The eyes are blank to the ears. Yeah, because the eyes are in this direction from the ears. But if I turned it around and I said the ears are blank to the eyes, what would you say? Yeah, because the ears are in this direction from the eyes. So the eyes are medial to the ears. The ears are lateral to the eyes. Does that make sense to everyone? So think about a few other things that you could say that with. So look, right here's the breastbone right here. And here's the nipple right here, and the other one over here. What if I said the breastbone is blank to the nipples? It's this way, so it's medial. But if you said the nipples are blank to the breastbone, you'd say lateral because it's this way. Think about your hand. Remember in anatomical position, here's your hand. So there's the thumb and the finger and the finger and the little finger. Here's your thumb and here's your little finger. Which one is medial and which one is lateral? Which is medial, which is lateral? Thumb is medial, that's exactly right. And, oh no, thumb, sorry, thumb is lateral, sorry. It's over here, look, it's over here, little finger is medial. Yes, I got excited. Does it make sense? So look at your feet. Which toe is medial and which toe is lateral? So the big toe is medial, the little toe is lateral. It's the opposite for the hands. But that's exactly right. But let's go back. If our thumb is lateral and our index finger and middle finger and ring finger and our little uh, bad hand anyway if that's all if that's lateral and this is medial what are these we need a word here's the word those are intermediate they're between lateral and medial Does that make sense? Same thing if we did the foot. So if you look at a foot, so there's a big toe and then this one and this one and this one and a little toe. So this is medial and this one's lateral. That makes these intermediate. Any questions about it? Okay, here's another pair, and this is the pair that most students have the most trouble with. The words are proximal and distal. I don't really understand why there's so much trouble with them, if you understand the root word. So let's look at this word proximal. So proximal has the same root word as approximate. So, approximate. So look, prox, prox. So if I say something is approximately four, what do I mean? What does prox mean? Something is approximately four, what does it mean? It means close to, that's right. And just like approximate means close to, so does proximal. And then look at this other word, it's distal. And it has the same root word as distant. 
So if I say something is distant, what do I mean? It's far. That's right. It's away from. So dist means far from. And so now all we have to decide is what we're talking about. What, what are we talking about? Close to? Close to what? Far from? Far from what? Well, when we say that, we're talking about the origin or the attachment to the trunk. The origin or the attachment to the trunk. And we only use this for arms or legs or something with a definite origin. So let's look at an arm. So here's an arm. There's your shoulder and your upper arm, your elbow and your lower arm. And then here's your hand. So look, where is the arm attached? Where is its origin? Is the origin down here at the hand or is the origin up here at the shoulder? It's at the shoulder. There's where the origin is. So these two words, remember? Proximal means close to the origin. Distal means far from. So if I move this way, which way am I moving? Proximally or distally? I'm moving proximally. What if I move in this direction? Which way am I moving? Proximally or distally? Distally. So what if I were to put numbers on here? So I'm going to put one, two, three, four on here. And I'm going to ask you, what is four compared to two? Four is blank to two. What goes in there? Is four closer or further away from the origin? And so what goes in here is proximal. But if I said one is blank to three, what would you put in there? So one is down here. It's further away from the origin than three is. And so it's distal. Well, now let's don't think about numbers. Let's think about, I don't know, let's say the joints. So here's the shoulder joint. Here's the elbow joint. And here's the wrist. So if I were to ask you, the wrist is blank to the elbow, what would you put in there? The wrist is blank to the elbow. Which one is closer to the origin, the wrist or the elbow? So which one's further away? So the wrist is distal to the elbow. But if you flip it around and you say the elbow is blank to the wrist, what's going to go in there? Again, which one is closer to the point of attachment? Which one's closer to the origin? The elbow is, so it's proximal. Let's do it for the leg. So I'm not going to draw the leg, but there's the leg. There's the legs. So what if I were to say the knee is blank to the ankle? Or what if I were to say the hip is blank to the knee? Or what if I were to say any of those things? So that's what I want you to do when you're studying. I want you to quiz yourself until you get it. Don't just say, oh, proximal and distal, I know what that is. Once you can use it in a sentence and use it correctly over and over without any mistakes, then you know what it is. Make sense to everyone? Here's another pair. This pair is easy. 
So it's superficial and deep. So superficial, all that means is closer to the surface. Closer to the surface. So if I were to say, look at something, an orange. So think about an orange. What is the most superficial part of an orange? The skin, yeah, the rind. So if I were to take a hypodermic syringe and I'm going to take a needle and I'm going to shove it in this orange, what happens when I push it further and further? Which direction am I going as I move this way? I'm going deeper and deeper. What happens when I pull it out? Which direction am I going? Superficial. So that's exactly the way this is here too. So think about a human, just like this orange. What is the most superficial part of a human? What is the most superficial? It's the skin, sure. And then if you go down, if you take the skin down a layer, what you're going to find is connective tissue. And then if you go a little deeper, you're going to find muscle. And if you go deeper, you're going to find bone. So what if I were to ask you the bones, sorry, the bones are blank to the muscles. Bones are deep to the muscles. That's exactly right. And then you can flip it around in the other direction too. So here are all those. So real quickly, see if you under remember what all these words mean. So superior, remember, means what? Above. What does inferior mean? Below. What does medial mean? Toward the what? Toward the midline. Don't say middle, midline. And what does lateral mean? Away from the midline. And then what does proximal mean? What does it mean when you go this way? What is it? Like approximate, closer, yeah, closer to the origin or the point of attachment. What does distal mean as you go this way? Farther from, yeah, farther away. And then superficial means close to the what? Surface. And then deep, further in, further away from the surface. And then these two, remember we went over these and we use these interchangeably, but don't forget they don't mean exactly the same thing. Anybody have any questions about any of those? Okay, well there's two more. If I were to go back, there's two more that we didn't talk about. And that's these two here. And in reality, they might be the most important ones, but they're also the most easily confused. So look, right and left is used here. And the exact same words are used here, right and left. But they're confusing. And the reason they're confusing is this. Whose right is it? If I say it's on the right, am I talking about my right or am I talking about your right? Because look, they're looking straight at each other. And if they say it's on the right, it's very easy to confuse what they're saying. She's thinking this or she's thinking this. Well, there's an easy way to make sure you don't mist make mistakes. And that is that it's always, always, always the patient's right. The patient's right. And the reason I harp on this so much is because it's so bad if you make a mistake. 
think about this. What if you were told that in room, I don't know, 223, there's a patient and that patient has to have their right foot amputated and you need to go in there and you need to prep for surgery. Well, you don't want to be the person standing at the bottom of the bed going, now, which one is it? Is it this one or is it this one? You don't want to be that person. Because think about what would happen if you were to make a mistake. And if nobody caught it and it made it all the way to surgery, what if they cut the wrong foot off? Well, think about what you've done. You've changed that person's life dramatically for the worse. Because think about it, that other foot is still diseased and that other foot still is going to have to be amputated. So this person's going to go from having one foot, maybe they could move around with crutches or, or a prosthetic pretty easily, to having no feet. Now that's pretty dramatic, but it doesn't have to be that bad. But every day, mistakes get made. And mistakes like that, they damage people's lives and they also make you subject to being sued and all sorts of things. Plus you have to live with it the rest of your life. So which one do you think this is, the right or the left? It's the same one on both pictures. Yes, it's the left. Now, how do I know it's the left? Because whose left is it? Yeah, it's the patient, it's the subject. What about this one? Is it left or right? Again, same one in both pictures. It's also the left. Okay, well, you might have something like that on a quiz, too. Any questions to this point? Everybody kind of getting it? Okay, well, remember we were talking about anatomy. And remember I said, if you were in the lecture, anatomy comes from two words, ana and tome. And those two words literally mean to cut. And for the longest, longest time, if you wanted to study anatomy, you had to cut things up. Well, when you cut things up, it's called a dissection. And what a di that word means, it literally means to separate into two parts. So one part over here and one part over here. That's all dissection means, is to separate into two parts. Well, to do that, we're going to make cuts. Well, there are only a certain number of ways that you can make cuts. And when you do make a cut, you get what's called a plane of dissection. A plane is a flat surface the flat surface along which the cut was made. That's a sectional or dissectional plane. So look, this person, this head, whatever this is, has been cut three ways. So they've been cut this way, this way, and then this way. And if you know anything about ge geometry, that corresponds to the three axes, the X, Y, and Z axes. Well, I suppose we could call them X, Y, and Z, but we don't. They, these sectional planes have their own names. And so let's look at this. So the first one we're going to look at is called a sagittal plane. So a sagittal plane is going to separate something into right and left portions. So if we were to look at that head, it looks like this and we made a cut like that. Here's the right side and here's the left side. So this section is a sagittal section. It's cut along a sagittal plane. Now, if you happen to cut exactly right in the center, right along the midline, you can also call it mid-sagittal. 
or sometimes even median. If it's not on the midline, it's called parasagittal. Para means beside. Now, I tend not to use either one of these words, but that doesn't mean you won't read them. But I just use sagittal. So sagittal is anything that divides the body vertically into right and left parts. So if we look at that, it looks like this. So this is a sagittal plane right here. And we're going to get a left portion and we're going to get a right portion. Anything that divides it into right and left. So if I were to make a cut right here, I'd still have a lot left and a right. And so if you look at a person, you can make millions of sagittal sections. You can make them over and over and over and over like this. Now you can only make one mid-sagittal, but you can make lots and lots of parasagittals. So if I did that through the skull, it would look like this. So look, the part we're seeing is the left side. The right side has been removed. But look, there's his nose. There's the lips. And you can see the tongue, the chin. These are sinuses. There's the brain and the spinal cord. This is a sagittal section. Any questions? Okay. You can also cut where you wind up with a front and a back. So a front portion and a back portion, an anterior and a posterior. So if this is our head again, but now it's looking this way, I can make this cut. And look, there's the front and there's the back. There's this anterior, and here's the posterior sections. So when we look at it, it looks like this. So this is, oh, and it's called a frontal or coronal plane. Sorry, I forgot to say that. It's called a frontal or coronal plane. And so we're going to get a front portion and a back portion, anterior and posterior. So this is a frontal plane. So if we did that through the skull, it would look like this. So look, doesn't look like the other one, but there it is. So there's the eyeballs right there. And then here's the nasal cavity, and there's a, the big sinuses in your cheek. There's the tongue, and there's the brain. So this is a frontal section, also called coronal. Does that make sense to everyone? And then there's one other way, or here's a frontal one. There's one other way that we can cut too. But look, here's our front and here's our back. That's a frontal section. Okay. And then the last way that you can cut gives you a top and a bottom. It gives you a superior and an inferior. And this is called a transverse or horizontal section. And so when we look at it, it's this yellow one right here. And so look, we wind up with a top portion and we wind up with a bottom portion. And again, you can make thousands and thousands of these. You could cut here, 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 all the way up and all the way down. All of these are transverse sections. So if we did that through the whole, it would look like this. So look, right here are the ears. Those are the ears. And there's the tongue right there. And there's the brain. These are cheek muscles. But look, it's the, the, the top has been removed. And so if we did this here, Here's the eyeball. So this is an enlarged one, but it's an eyeball. There's the top and there's the bottom. So this section is transverse.
Here's another transverse section. This is an enlargement of the spinal cord. But look, there's more up here that's been removed. So that's a transverse section. So here are those three sections. Up here, these are MRIs. And down here, these are basically colorized MRIs. They use a computer. Let's see if you can match these up and see if you can name them. So here's A, here's B, here's C, here's D, here's E, and here's F. So first of all, figure out which ones are which. Anybody want to try? So which two are sagittal? E is not sagittal. Which two are sagittal? B and D. That's right. This one's sagittal and this one's sagittal. Which two are frontal? C and E. That's exactly right. And so that leaves A and F as being transverse. So that could be another quiz question, something like that. And even if you don't really know exactly what all these organs are, you can still tell what these sections are. It gets a little harder when you're talking about an individual organ. So if you know a lot about the brain, then you probably would know this. But look what happens when you take it out. It's not as easy to figure out what these sections are, unless you already know. It helps if you have structures that you do already know. Okay, there's one other way to cut. So remember we had X, Y, and Z, but you don't have to cut on those. Those are all 90 degree angles to each other. If I wanted to, I could cut like this, or like this, or like that, or like this. Well, if it's not one of those we already talked about, if it's any kind of thing that's not on these 90 degree angles, it's called an oblique. So oblique sections are diagonal sections. But we try to avoid diagonal sections because they're very confusing. Look at a face. If you cut a face, we expect what you have on one side to have on, be on the other because we're bilaterally symmetrical. But if you cut it this way, Look what, the, and, then, and then if you think about what this person would look like, they would sort of look like this, and I might be able to draw it very well, but they would look like this. So their eyes would be here like this, and they'd have one nose over here and another nose over here, and then they, they'd have a big mouth over here and a big mouth over here. They wouldn't look anything like what we expect to look like. So... We try to avoid these because they're confusing. The problem is you can't avoid them all the time. And so if you can't avoid them, we usually wind up ignoring them. So we just pretend that didn't happen. But here are those three planes. So sagittal, and look, this says mid-sagittal. I wouldn't do that. I would just say sagittal but sagittal, frontal, transverse. And then if you look at what happens with the individual body parts, they look very, very different depending on what uh, section is used. Any questions about that? Okay, but remember when we took the brain out and cut it? So here's the brain that we took it out and cut it. Again, it becomes sort of difficult. Unless you really, really know what the brain looks like, it's kind of difficult to figure out what these are. Well, what if it were a small intestine? So the small intestine goes like this. It's a tube, and it rambles and turns and twists all through the body. So what if I had 
the small intestine and I made a cut like that, well, I don't know where these pieces were. I don't have any idea. It could have been there, it could have been here, it could have been here. And so when you look at individual organs, sometimes it's impossible to tell if it's sagittal or if it's frontal. So here is that small intestine that I just talked about. And look, I don't know. I don't know the position that this was in inside the body. I just don't know. And if I don't know, this could be sagittal because this could be the left and this could be the right. It could be transverse because this could be the top and this could be the bottom. It could be frontal because this could be the anterior and this could be the posterior. I just don't know. But what I do know is when I make this cut, it was cut long ways. And if I make this cut, look, it's round. It was cut straight across. Across. And if I look at this one, look, it's oval shaped. And so it was cut at an angle. And so instead of using sagittal and frontal and so on, what we use are longitudinal, transverse, or sometimes cross, and oblique. So look, we can see that. Well, here's a leg. I know what a leg looks like, but what if I didn't give you this part? What if I just gave you this up here? It'd be hard to know unless you really, really were a good anatomist to know which direction this was cut. Could have been cut that way, could have been cut this way, but I can tell that it was cut long ways. And look, here this is round. So I know it's not long ways, and because it's round, it's transverse. And I know this one is not cut long ways, but I know here this is oval shaped. And because it's oval, it's oblique. Does it make sense to everyone? So look, this could be a bone, but it could also be a blood vessel. It could also be uh, a tubule or a tube. I don't know, and I don't know what position it is in the body, and you don't either. Nobody knows. But I know what these sections are because I can tell the directions they were cut on the tube. So what do you think these are? What is A, B, and C? What is A? Transverse. That's exactly right. What about B? It's oblique. And what about C? That's longitudinal. Any questions about that? Another thing we're going to do is we're going to start looking at tissues. Now, not today, but we're going to be looking at tissues. And tissues are bunches and bunches of cells. Well, when we look at a cell under a microscope, most of us see something that looks flat, but cells are not flat. They're three-dimensional. And a very good analogy for a cell is a boiled egg. It's a good analogy. So, if this were a cell, what would this yellow thing be? What part of the cell would this be? It would be the nucleus. What part would the white part be? It'd be the cytoplasm. And what did this little bitty line right here be? That would be the membrane. But look, if I look at this boiled egg, it's been sliced. And it's been sliced along three or five different planes. 
So I can do the same thing with a cell. You may not think of a cell as being three-dimensional, but they are. And so when I slice a cell, it's the same as slicing this egg. Well, everybody in here knows what a boiled egg looks like, probably. But does everybody in here know what cells look like? All the cells of the body? Probably not. They all look different. And so when you look at a tissue, it's basically a bunch of cells that have been sliced. And depending on where the cut was made, you may get a cell that looks like this. So look at this. If that's a cell and you've never seen this cell before, you would think this cell has no nucleus. Is that true? Does a cell have no nucleus? No. It just means that the cut was made right here and the nucleus is over here. So if the nucleus is here and I make the cut right here, you're not going to see a nucleus. And if I make the cut here, you're not going to see a nucleus, just like that. And if I just slice it right here, Look, the nucleus is going to look too small. It's not going to look the way it's supposed to. So when we start looking at tissues, you're going to see all of this in one view. You're going to see some cells that are cut like this, and some cells that are cut like this, and some cells that are cut like this. Well, if I were to ask you to pick out the best representation of this boiled egg, which one would you pick? A, B, C, D, you'd pick C. So if you saw a bunch of cells lined up and they were like this, 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 and this, this is the one you should look at. This is the one you should pay attention to. These others, there's something wrong with the cut. They're not good representations of the cell. Well, you're going to have to do that on your own. I can show you how to do it, but I'm not going to be there with you when you're doing it. Does it make sense to everyone? Look, here's elbow macaroni. Same thing. Look, those cuts were made like this. And look how different these things look. None of them look like elbow macaroni but they look very, very different from each other. And so again, depending on how tissues are cut, depending on how cells are cut, they look very, very different from each other. Any questions about it? So look, this cut here and this cut here, and all, they're all made basically through the same structures, and yet they look very, very different from each other. So here's our egg analogy and here's a tissue over here look at this this is round what kind of section is that it's just like this what kind of section is it transverse look this one is long what kind of section is that it's the same as this. It's a longitudinal. Here's another longitudinal section. And there's an oval one. And then look at this. Look at this. Every single one of these cells right here is like an egg. But look, this egg. There's no nucleus. This one, no nucleus, no nucleus, no nucleus. There's a good one right there. And then no nucleus. And there's a good one right there. So if I want to pick cells to look at, I'm not going to look at this or this. I'm going to look at this one. Look how perfect that cell is. So if I want to know what that cell really, really looks like in all of these cells, I want to know what that egg really, really looks like. I'm going to pick this one. I'm going to pick this one. 
Do you see what I mean when I say how some of them have their nuclei cut away? Some of them are cut at weird angles, different angles. Ideally, they would all look like this. This is what these cells would look like right here, ideally. And if this were a perfect section, that's what they looked like. But there are no perfect sections. Does that make sense to everyone? So, how are we doing? Anybody have any questions? Okay, well, that's where we're going to stop for today. So next time when we come back, we'll pick up here at cavities and membranes and we'll finish this up. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now.